Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 609, Rehabilitating a Saint. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am packing is what I'm doing <laughs> because later today I am leaving for Ireland with some of you. And I am very excited about that. And I absolutely believe I will get all of this done. No question. No, actually, I really am not overly stressed about things, probably foolishly, but it is remarkably easier to determine what should be packed based on the criteria that I mentioned last week, which is weight. I can now look at clothes and say, "Mm, this or that, well, this one weighs less, so this one is the one that goes, that stays here. And that goes for everything else as well. Crafty stuff, books, all that. What weighs the most, what takes up the most space, decided for me. I really am kind of loving that. But all of that aside, we have Joan of Arc for you. Ooh, but I do have a video to share with you as well. I don't know how it popped up in my feed. I haven't been watching anything like this lately, but it was a a video. It's no audio to speak of. It's just the visual of somebody coming up with a very creative way of mending a hole in a sweater. And it's, a, it's an attractive way to mend the hole. It could be invisible if you really wanted it to be. But it was remarkably creative. The person doing it used a little hook that is not a crochet hook. It is a very, very small latch hook hook, similar to the ones that come with the speed weave, but even more tinier dist. Nonetheless, really remarkable. So I am putting a link to that video into the show notes for you to be amazed by as well. But that has nothing to do with Joan. So today is our last four chapters of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc. I know you know what's coming. Over the last two days, I have read all of the trial of rehabilitation or nullification. It gets called different things, rehabilitation, reconciliation, nullification. Either way, it is the years-long process of clearing Joan's name, clearing Joan's family's name, and clearing Charles VII's name, really, name of Charles being king. Because if Charles had been helped into being king by a heretic, that wouldn't look so good for Charles. So there were some political reasons for the trial of rehabilitation along with the, let's come down on the side of justice on this one, guys. Because I've now read all of the English translation of that court's documents, I can say this. Obviously, when you are listening to it today, you will realize none of what Twain is writing about was in the trial of condemnation. Well, chunks of it, small chunks of it at the beginning are from the trial of condemnation. And they cross-reference and line up with uh, testimony from the trial of nullification as well. Almost all of the quote-unquote facts that you hear today are lifted from the mouths of people who testified later in time. So she was burnt at the stake May 30th, 1431. The trial of nullification started getting its wheels rolling in 1450, 50. It wasn't concluded for another six years, but uh, we will talk more about that on the flip side as well. I don't think you need me for a whole lot pre-chapters, except for one thing, in case your memory, like mine, has been filled with lots of other things over the course of these three volumes. Way, way, way back in the very beginning, Mark Twain told us that the children sang a song around the fairy tree. You will hear a quote in our second chapter today. The fairy tree gets mentioned, and then shortly thereafter, a quote pops up 
if the quote doesn't ring a bell, I am here to tell you that is from the children's song. It is not from the Bible or from anything else. It is part of the children's song. And that is everything you need to know, I think, before we dive in. So dive in we shall with chapters 22, 23, 24, and 25, which makes up the end of the book of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc, written by Mark Twain and read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Volume 2, Book 3, Chapter 22, Joan Gives the Fatal Answer. Friday and Saturday were happy days for Noel and me. Our minds were full of our splendid dream of France aroused, France shaking her mane, France on the march, France at the gates, Rouen in ashes and Joan free. Our imagination was on fire. We were delirious with pride and joy, for we were very young, as I have said. We knew nothing about what had been happening in the dungeon in the yester afternoon. We supposed that as Joan had abjured and been taken back into the forgiving bosom of the church, she was being gently used now, and her captivity made as pleasant and comfortable for her as the circumstances would allow. So, in high contentment, we planned out our share in the great rescue, and fought our part of the fight over and over again during those two happy days, as happy days as ever I have known. Sunday morning came. I was awake, enjoying the balmy, lazy weather, and thinking. Thinking of the rescue, what else? I had no other thought now. I was absorbed in that, drunk with the happiness of it. I heard a voice shouting far down the street, and soon it came nearer, and I caught the words, "'Joan of Arc has relapsed! The witch's time has come!' It stopped my heart. It turned my blood to ice." That was more than sixty years ago, but that triumphant note rings as clear in my memory today as it rang in my ear that long-vanished summer morning. We are so strangely made. The memories that could make us happy pass away. It is the memories that break our hearts that abide. Soon other voices took up that cry. Tens, scores, hundreds of voices— all the world seemed filled with the brutal joy of it, and there were other clamors, the clatter of rushing feet, merry congratulations, bursts of coarse laughter, the rolling of drums, the boom and crash of distant bands profaning the sacred day with the music of victory and thanksgiving. About the middle of the afternoon came a summons for Monchon and me to go to Joan's dungeon, a summons from Cochon but by that time distrust had already taken possession of the English and their soldiery again, and all Rouen was in an angry and threatening mood. We could see plenty of evidences of this from our own windows, fist-shaking, black looks, tumultuous tides of furious men billowing by along the street, and we learned that up at the castle things were going very badly indeed that there was a great mob gathered there who considered the relapse a lie and a priestly trick, and among them many half-drunk English soldiers. Moreover, these people had gone beyond words. They had laid hands upon a number of churchmen who were trying to enter the castle, and it had been difficult work to rescue them and save their lives. And so Marchand refused to go. He said he would not go a step without a safeguard from Warwick. So next morning Warwick sent an escort of soldiers— and then we went. Matters had not grown peacefuler meantime, but worse. The soldiers protected us from bodily damage, but as we passed through the great mob at the castle we were assailed with insults and shameful epithets. I bore it well enough, though, and said to myself with secret satisfaction, "'In three or four short days, my lads, you will be employing your tongues in a different sort from this, and I shall be there to hear.' To my mind these were as good as dead men. How many of them would still be alive after the rescue that was coming? Not more than enough to amuse the executioner a short half-hour, certainly. It turned out that the report was true. Joan had relapsed. She was sitting there in her chains, clothed again in her male attire. She accused nobody. That was her way. It was not in her character to hold a servant to account for what his master had made him do, and her mind had cleared now, 
and she knew that the advantage which had been taken of her the previous morning had its origin not in the subordinate but in the master cochon here is what had happened while joan slept in the early morning of sunday one of the guards stole her female apparel and put her male attire in its place when she woke she asked for the other dress but the guards refused to give it back she protested and said she was forbidden to wear the male dress but they continued to refuse she had to have clothing for modesty's sake moreover she saw that she could not save her life if she must fight for it against treacheries like this so she put on the forbidden garments knowing what the end would be she was weary of the struggle poor thing we had followed in the wake of cochon the vice inquisitor and the others six or eight and when i saw joan sitting there despondent forlorn and still in chains when i was expecting to find her situation so different i did not know what to make of it the shock was very great i had doubted the relapse perhaps possibly i had believed in it but had not realized it cochon's victory was complete he had had a harassed and irritated and disgusted look for a long time but that was all gone now and contentment and serenity had taken its place his purple face was full of tranquil and malicious happiness he went trailing his robes and stood grandly in front of joan with his legs apart and remained so more than a minute gloating over her and enjoying the sight of this poor ruined creature who had won so lofty a place for him in the service of the meek and merciful jesus saviour of the world lord of the universe in case england kept her promises to him who kept no promises himself presently the judges began to question joan one of them named marguerite who was a man with more insight than prudence remarked upon joan's change of clothing and said there is something suspicious about this how could it have come about without connivance on the part of others perhaps even something worse thousand devils screamed cochon in a fury will you shut your mouth armagnac traitor shouted the soldiers on guard and made a rush for marguerite with their lances leveled it was with the greatest difficulty that he was saved from being run through the body he made no more attempts to help the inquiry poor man the other judges proceeded with the questionings why have you resumed this male habit i did not quite catch her answer for just then a soldier's halbert slipped from his fingers and fell on the stone floor with a crash but i thought i understood joan to say that she had resumed it of her own motion but you have promised and sworn that you would not go back to it i was full of anxiety to hear her answer to that question and when it came it was just what i was expecting she said quite quietly i have never intended and never understood myself to swear i would not resume it there i had been sure all along that she did not know what she was doing and saying on the platform thursday and this answer of hers was proof that i had not been mistaken then she went on to add this but i had a right to resume it because the promises made to me have not been kept promises that i should be allowed to go to mass and receive the communion and that i should be freed from the bondage of these chains but they are still upon me as you see nevertheless you have abjured and have especially promised to return no more to the dress of a man then joan held out her fettered hand sorrowfully toward these unfeeling men and said i would rather die than continue so but if they may be taken off and if i may hear mass and be removed to a penitential prison and have a woman about me i will be good and will do what shall seem good to you that i do cochon sniffed scoffingly at that honor the compact which he and his had made with her fulfill its conditions what need of that conditions had been a good thing to concede temporarily and for advantage but they have served their turn let something of a fresher sort and of more consequence be considered the resumption of the male dress was sufficient for all practical purposes but perhaps joan could be led to add something to that fatal crime so cochon asked her if her voices had spoken to her since thursday and he reminded her of her abjuration yes she answered and then it came out that the voices had talked with her about the abjuration told her about it i suppose she guilelessly reasserted the heavenly origin of her mission 
and did it with the untroubled mien of one who was not conscious that she had ever knowingly repudiated it so i was convinced once more that she had had no notion of what she was doing that thursday morning on the platform finally she said my voices told me i did very wrong to confess that what i had done was not well then she sighed and said with simplicity but it was the fear of the fire that made me do so that is fear of the fire had made her sign a paper whose contents she had not understood then but understood now by revelation of her voices and by testimony of her persecutors she was sane now and not exhausted her courage had come back and with it her inborn loyalty to the truth she was bravely and serenely speaking it again knowing that it would deliver her body up to that very fire which had such terrors for her that answer of hers was quite long quite frank wholly free from concealments or palliations it made me shudder i knew she was pronouncing sentence of death upon herself so did poor manchon and he wrote in the margin abreast of it responsio mortifera fatal answer yes all present knew that it was indeed a fatal answer then there fell a silence such as falls in a sick-room when the watchers of the dying draw a deep breath and say softly to one another all is over here likewise all was over but after some moments cochon wishing to clinch this matter and make it final put this question do you still believe that your voices are saint marguerite and saint catherine yes and that they come from god yet you denied them on the scaffold then she made direct and clear affirmation that she had never had any intention to deny them and that if i noted the if if she had made some retractions and revocations on the scaffold it was from fear of the fire and it was a violation of the truth there it is again you see she certainly never knew what it was she had done on the scaffold until she was told of it afterward by these people and by her voices and now she closed this most painful scene with these words and there was a weary note in them that was pathetic i would rather do my penance all at once let me die i cannot endure captivity any longer the spirit born for sunshine and liberty so longed for release that it would take it in any form even that several among the company of judges went from the place troubled and sorrowful the others in another mood in the court of the castle we found the earl of warwick and fifty english waiting impatient for news as soon as cochon saw them he shouted laughing think of a man destroying a friendless poor girl and then having the heart to laugh at it <laughs> make yourselves comfortable it's all over with her end of chapter twenty two book three chapter twenty three the time is at hand the young can sink into abysses of despondency and it was so with noel and me now but the hopes of the young are quick to rise again and it was so with ours we called back that vague promise of the voices and said the one to the other that the glorious release was to happen at the last moment that other time was not the last moment but this is it will happen now the king will come la Hire will come and with them our veterans and behind them all france and so we were full of heart again and could already hear in fancy that stirring music the clash of steel and the war cries and the uproar of the onset and in fancy see our prisoner free her chains gone her sword in her hand but this dream was to pass also and come to nothing late at night when manchon came in he said i am come from the dungeon and i have a message for you from that poor child a message to me if he had been noticing i think he would have discovered me discovered that my indifference concerning the prisoner was a pretense for i was caught off my guard and was so moved and so exalted to be so honored by her that i must have shown my feeling in my face and manner a, a message for me your reverence yes it is something she wishes done 
she said she had noticed the young man who helps me and that he had a good face and did i think he would do a kindness for her i said i knew you would and asked her what it was and she said a letter would you write a letter to her mother and i said you would but i said i would do it myself and gladly but she said no that my labors were heavy and she thought the young man would not mind the doing of this service for one not able to do it for herself she not knowing how to write then i would have sent for you and at that the sadness vanished out of her face why it was as if she was going to see a friend poor friendless thing but i was not permitted i did my best but the orders remain as strict as ever the doors are closed against all but officials as before none but officials may speak to her so i went back and told her and she sighed and was sad again now this is what she begs you to write to her mother it is partly a strange message and to me means nothing but she said her mother would understand you will convey her adoring love to her family and her village friends and say there will be no rescue for that this night and it is the third time in the twelvemonth and is final she has seen the vision of the tree how strange yes it is strange but that is what she said and said her parents would understand and for a little time she was lost in dreams and thinkings and her lips moved and i caught in her muttering these lines which she said over two or three times and they seemed to bring peace and contentment to her i set them down thinking they might have some connection with her letter and be useful but it was not so they were a mere memory floating idly in a tired mind and they have no meaning at least no relevancy i took the piece of paper and found what i knew i should find and when in exile wandering we shall fainting yearn for glimpse of thee o oh, rise upon our sight there was no hope any more i knew it now i knew that joan's letter was a message to noel and me as well as to her family and that its object was to banish vain hopes from our minds and tell us from her own mouth of the blow that was going to fall upon us so that we being her soldiers would know it for a command to bear it as became us and her and so submit to the will of god and in thus obeying find assuagement of our grief it was like her for she was always thinking of others not of herself yes her heart was sore for us she could find time to think of us the humblest of her servants and try to soften our pain lighten the burden of our troubles she that was drinking of the bitter waters she that was walking in the valley of the shadow of death i wrote the letter you will know what it cost me without my telling you i wrote it with the same wooden stylus which had put upon parchment the first words ever dictated by joan of arc that high summons to the english to vacate france two years past when she was a lass of seventeen it had now set down the last ones which she was ever to dictate then i broke it for the pen that had served joan of arc could not serve any that would come after her in this earth without abasement the next day may twenty ninth cochon summoned his serfs and forty-two responded it is charitable to believe that the other twenty were ashamed to come the forty-two pronounced her a relapsed heretic and condemned her to be delivered over to the secular arm cochon thanked them then he sent orders that joan of arc be conveyed the next morning to the place known as the old market and that she be then delivered to the civil judge and by the civil judge to the executioner that meant she would be burnt all the afternoon and evening of tuesday the twenty ninth the news was flying and the people of the countryside flocking to rouen to see the tragedy all at least who could prove their english sympathies and count upon admission the press grew thicker and thicker in the streets the excitement grew higher and higher and now a thing was noticeable again which had been noticeable more than once before that there was pity for joan in the hearts of many of these people whenever she had been in great danger it had manifested itself and now it was apparent again manifest in a pathetic dumb sorrow which was visible in many faces early the next morning wednesday martin ladvenu and another friar were sent to joan to prepare her for death 
and Manchon and I went with them, a hard service for me. We tramped through the dim corridors, winding this way and that, and piercing ever deeper and deeper into that vast heart of stone, and at last we stood before Joan. But she did not know it. She sat with her hands in her lap and her head bowed, thinking, and her face was very sad. One might not know what she was thinking of, of her home, and the peaceful pastures, and the friends she was no more to see, of her wrongs, and her forsaken estate, and the cruelties which had been put upon her. Or was it of death, the death which she had longed for, and which was now so close? Or was it of the kind of death she must suffer? I hoped not, for she feared only one kind, and that one had for her unspeakable terrors. I believed she so feared that one, that with her strong will she would shut the thought of it wholly out of her mind, and hope and believe that God would take pity on her, and grant her an easier one. And so it might chance that the awful news which we were bringing might come as a surprise to her at last. We stood silent a while, but she was still unconscious of us, still deep in her sad musings and far away. Then Martin Ladvenu said softly, Joan? She looked up then, with a little start and a wan smile, and said, Speak. Have you a message for me? Yes, poor child. Try to bear it. Do you think you can bear it? Yes. Very softly, and her head drooped again. I am come to prepare you for death. A faint shiver trembled through her wasted body. There was a pause. In the stillness we could hear our breathings. Then she said, still in that low voice, When will it be? The muffled notes of a tolling bell floated to our ears out of the distance. Now. The time is at hand. That slight shiver passed again. It is so soon. Ah, it is so soon. There was a long silence. The distant throbbings of the bell pulsed through it, and we stood motionless and listening. But it was broken at last. What death is it? By fire. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. She sprang wildly to her feet, and wound her hands in her hair, and began to writhe and sob, oh, so piteously, and mourn, and grieve, and lament, and turn to first one and then another of us, and search our faces beseechingly, as hoping she might find help and friendliness there, poor thing, she that had never denied these to any creature, even her wounded enemy on the battlefield. Oh, cruel, cruel to treat me so! And must my body that has never been defiled be consumed to-day and turned to ashes? Ah, sooner would I that my head were cut off seven times than suffer this woeful death. I had the promise of the church's prison when I submitted, and if I had but been there, and not left here in the hands of my enemies, this miserable fate had not befallen me. Oh, I appeal to God, the great judge, against the injustice which has been done me. There was none there that could endure it. They turned away, with the tears running down their faces. In a moment I was on my knees at her feet. At once she thought only of my danger, and bent and whispered in my ear, Up! Do not peril yourself, good heart. There, God bless you always. And I felt the quick clasp of her hand. Mine was the last hand she touched with hers in life. None saw it. History does not know of it or tell of it. Yet it is true, just as I have told it. The next moment she saw Cochon coming, and she went and stood before him and reproached him, saying, Bishop, it is by you that I die. He was not shamed, not touched, but said smoothly, Ah, be patient, Joan. You die because you have not kept your promise, but have returned to your sins. Alas, she said, if you had put me in the church's prison and given me right and proper keepers as you promised, this would not have happened, and for this I summon you to answer before God. Then Cochon winced, and looked less placidly content than before, and he turned him about and went away. Joan stood a while musing. 
she grew calmer but occasionally she wiped her eyes and now and then sobs shook her body but their violence was modifying now and the intervals between them were growing longer finally she looked up and saw pierre maurice who had come in with the bishop and she said to him master peter where shall i be this night have you not good hope in god yes and by his grace i shall be in paradise now martin ladvenu heard her in confession then she begged for the sacrament but how grant the communion to one who had been publicly cut off from the church and was now no more entitled to its privileges than an unbaptized pagan the brother could not do this but he sent to cochon to inquire what he must do all laws human and divine were alike to that man he respected none of them he sent back orders to grant joan whatever she wished her last speech to him had reached his fears perhaps it could not reach his heart for he had none the eucharist was brought now to that poor soul that had yearned for it with such unutterable longing all these desolate months it was a solemn moment while we had been in the deeps of the prison the public courts of the castle had been filling up with crowds of the humbler sort of men and women who had learned what was going on in joan's cell and had come with softened hearts to do they knew not what to hear uh, they knew not what we knew nothing of this for they were out of our view and there were other great crowds of the like cast gathered in masses outside the castle gates and when the lights and the other accompaniments of the sacrament passed by coming to joan in the prison all those multitudes kneeled down and began to pray for her and many wept and when the solemn ceremony of the communion began in joan's cell out of the distance a moving sound was borne moaning to our ears it was those invisible multitudes chanting the litany for a departing soul the fear of the fiery death was gone from joan of arc now to come again no more except for one fleeting instant then it would pass and serenity and courage would take its place and abide till the end end of chapter twenty three book three chapter twenty four joan the martyr at nine o'clock the maid of orleans deliverer of france went forth in the grace of her innocence and her youth to lay down her life for the country she loved with such devotion and for the king that had abandoned her she sat in the cart that is used only for felons in one respect she was treated worse than a felon for whereas she was on her way to be sentenced by the civil arm she already bore her judgment inscribed in advance upon a mitre-shaped cap which she wore heretic relapsed apostate idolater in the cart with her sat the friar martin ladvenu and maitre jean massieu she looked girlishly fair and sweet and saintly in her long white robe and when a gush of sunlight flooded her as she emerged from the gloom of the prison and was yet for a moment still framed in the arch of the sombre gate the massed multitudes of poor folk murmured a vision a vision and sank to their knees praying and many of the women weeping and the moving invocation for the dying arose again and was taken up and borne along a majestic wave of sound which accompanied the doomed solacing and blessing her all the sorrowful way to the place of death christ have pity saint margaret have pity pray for her all ye saints archangels and blessed martyrs pray for her saints and angels intercede for her from thy wrath good lord deliver her o lord god save her have mercy on her we beseech thee good lord it is just and true what one of the histories has said the poor and the helpless had nothing but their prayers to give joan of arc but these we may believe were not unavailing there are few more pathetic events recorded in history than this weeping helpless praying crowd holding their lighted candles and kneeling on the pavement beneath the prison walls of the old fortress and it was so all the way thousands upon thousands massed upon their knees and stretching far down the distances thick sown with the faint yellow candle flames like a field starred with golden flowers but there were some that did not kneel these were the english soldiers 
they stood elbow to elbow on each side of joan's road and walled it in all the way and behind these living walls knelt the multitudes by and by a frantic man in priest's garb came wailing and lamenting and tore through the crowd and the barriers of soldiers and flung himself on his knees by joan's cart and put up his hands in supplication crying out oh forgive forgive it was Loisleur, and joan forgave him forgave him out of a heart that knew nothing but forgiveness nothing but compassion nothing but pity for all that suffer let their offence be what it might and she had no word of reproach for this poor wretch who had wrought day and night with deceits and treacheries and hypocrisies to betray her to her death the soldiers would have killed him but the earl of warwick saved his life what became of him is not known he hid himself from the world somewhere to endure his remorse as he might in the square of the old market stood the two platforms and the stake that had stood before in the churchyard of st ouen the platforms were occupied as before the one by joan and her judges the other by great dignitaries the principal being cochon and the english cardinal winchester the square was packed with people the windows and roofs of the blocks of buildings surrounded it were black with them when the preparations had been finished all noise and movement gradually ceased and a waiting stillness followed which was solemn and impressive and now by order of cochon an ecclesiastic named nicholas midi preached a sermon wherein he explained that when a branch of the vine which is the church becomes diseased and corrupt it must be cut away or it will corrupt and destroy the whole vine he made it appear that joan through her wickedness was a menace and a peril to the church's purity and holiness and her death therefore necessary when he was come to the end of his discourse he turned toward her and paused a moment then he said joan the church can no longer protect you go in peace joan had been placed wholly apart and conspicuous to signify the church's abandonment of her and she sat there in her loneliness waiting in patience and resignation for the end cochon addressed her now he had been advised to read the form of her abjuration to her and had brought it with him but he changed his mind fearing that she would proclaim the truth that she had never knowingly abjured and so bring shame upon him and eternal infamy he contented himself with admonishing her to keep in mind her wickedness and repent of it and think of her salvation then he solemnly pronounced her excommunicate and cut off from the body of the church with a final word he delivered her over to the secular arm for judgment and sentence joan weeping knelt and began to pray for whom herself oh no for the king of france her voice rose sweet and clear and penetrated all hearts with its passionate pathos she never thought of his treacheries to her she never thought of his desertion of her she never remembered that it was because he was an ingrate that she was here to die a miserable death she remembered only that he was her king that she was his loyal and loving subject and that his enemies had undermined his cause with evil reports and false charges and he not by to defend himself and so in the very presence of death she forgot her own troubles to implore all in her hearing to be just to him to believe that he was good and noble and sincere and not in any way to blame for any acts of hers neither advising them nor urging them but being wholly clear and free of all responsibility for them then closing she begged in humble and touching words that all here present would pray for her and would pardon her both her enemies and such as might look friendly upon her and feel pity for her in their hearts there was hardly one heart there that was not touched even the english even the judges showed it and there was many a lip that trembled and many an eye that was blurred with tears yes even the english cardinals that man with a political heart of stone but a human heart of flesh the secular judge who should have delivered judgment and pronounced sentence was himself so disturbed that he forgot his duty and joan went to her death unsentenced thus completing with an illegality 
what had begun illegally and had so continued to the end he only said to the guards take her and to the executioner do your duty joan asked for a cross none was able to furnish one but an english soldier broke a stick in two and crossed the pieces and tied them together and this cross he gave her moved to it by the good heart that was in him and she kissed it and put it in her bosom then isambert de la priere went to the church near by and brought her a consecrated one and this one also she kissed and pressed it to her bosom with rapture and then kissed it again and again covering it with tears and pouring out her gratitude to god and the saints and so weeping and with her cross to her lips she climbed up the cruel steps to the face of the stake with the friar isambard at her side then she was helped up to the top of the pile of wood that was built around the lower third of the stake and stood upon it with her back against the stake and the world gazing up at her breathless the executioner ascended to her side and wound chains around her slender body and so fastened her to the stake then he descended to finish his dreadful office and there she remained alone she that had had so many friends in the days when she was free and had been so loved and so dear all these things i saw albeit dimly and blurred with tears but i could bear no more i continued in my place but what i shall deliver to you now i got by others eyes and others mouths tragic sounds there were that pierced my ears and wounded my heart as i sat there but it is as i tell you the latest image recorded by my eyes in that desolating hour was joan of arc with the grace of her comely youth still unmarred and that image untouched by time or decay has remained with me all my days now i will go on if any thought that now in that solemn hour when all transgressors repent and confess she would revoke her revocation and say her great deeds had been evil deeds and satan and his friends their source they erred no such thought was in her blameless mind she was not thinking of herself and her troubles but of others and of woes that might befall them and so turning her grieving eyes about her where rose the towers and spires of that fair city she said oh rouen rouen must i die here and must you be my tomb ah rouen rouen i have great fear that you will suffer for my death a whiff of smoke swept upward past her face and for one moment terror seized her and she cried out water give me holy water but the next moment her fears were gone and they came no more to torture her she heard the flames crackling below her and immediately distress for a fellow-creature who was in danger took possession of her it was the friar isambard she had given him her cross and begged him to raise it toward her face and let her eyes rest in hope and consolation upon it till she was entered into the peace of god she made him go out from the danger of the fire then she was satisfied and said now keep it always in my sight until the end not even yet could cochon that man without shame endure to let her die in peace but went toward her all black with crimes and sins as he was and cried out i am come joan to exhort you for the last time to repent and seek the pardon of god i die through you she said and these were the last words she spoke to any upon earth then the pitchy smoke shot through with red flashes of flame rolled up in a thick volume and hid her from sight and from the heart of this darkness her voice rose strong and eloquent in prayer and when by moments the wind shredded somewhat of the smoke aside there were veiled glimpses of an upturned face and moving lips at last a mercifully swift tide of flame burst upward and none saw that face any more nor that form and the voice was still yes she was gone from us joan of arc 
what little words they are to tell of a rich world made empty and poor end of chapter 24 this is the conclusion of personal recollections of joan of arc volume 2 book 3 conclusion joan's brother jacques died in domremy during the great trial at rouen this was according to the prophecy which joan made that day in the pastures the time that she said the rest of us would go to the great wars when her poor old father heard of the martyrdom it broke his heart and he died the mother was granted a pension by the city of orleans and upon this she lived out her days which were many twenty-four years after her illustrious child's death she travelled all the way to paris in the winter time and was present at the opening of the discussion in the cathedral of notre dame which was the first step in the rehabilitation paris was crowded with people from all about france who came to get sight of the venerable dame and it was a touching spectacle when she moved through these reverend wet-eyed multitudes on her way to the grand honors awaiting her at the cathedral with her were jean and pierre no longer the light-hearted youths who marched with us from vaucouleurs but war-torn veterans with hair beginning to show frost after the martyrdom noel and i went back to domremy but presently when the constable richemont superseded la tremouille as the king's chief adviser and began the completion of joan's great work we put on our harness and returned to the field and fought for the king all through the wars and skirmishes until france was freed of the english it was what joan would have desired of us and dead or alive her desire was law for us all the survivors of the personal staff were faithful to her memory and fought for the king to the end mainly we were well scattered but when paris fell we happened to be together it was a great day and a joyous but it was a sad one at the same time because joan was not there to march into the captured capital with us noel and i remained always together and i was by his side when death claimed him it was in the last great battle of the war in that battle fell also joan's sturdy old enemy talbot he was eighty-five years old and had spent his whole life in battle a fine old lion he was with his flowing white mane and his tameless spirit yes and his indestructible energy as well for he fought as knightly and vigorous a fight that day as the best man there la Hire survived the martyrdom thirteen years and all was fighting of course for that was all he enjoyed in life i did not see him in all that time for we were far apart but one was always hearing of him the bastard of orleans and d'alencon and dolon lived to see france free and to testify with jean and pierre d'arc and pasquerel and me at the rehabilitation but they are all at rest now these many years i alone am left of those who fought at the side of joan of arc in the great wars she said i would live until those wars were forgotten a prophecy which failed if i should live a thousand years it would still fail for whatsoever had touched with joan of arc that thing is immortal members of joan's family married and they have left descendants their descendants are of the nobility but their family name and blood bring them honors which no other nobles receive or may hope for you have seen how everybody along the way uncovered when those children came yesterday to pay their duty to me it was not because they are noble it is because they are grandchildren of the brothers of joan of arc now as to the rehabilitation joan crowned the king at rheims for reward he allowed her to be hunted to her death without making one effort to save her during the next twenty-three years he remained indifferent to her memory indifferent to the fact that her good name was under a damning blot put there by the priest because of the deeds which she had done in saving him and his scepter indifferent to the fact that france was ashamed and longed to have the deliverer's fair fame restored indifferent all that time then he suddenly changed and was anxious to have justice for poor joan himself why had he become grateful at last had remorse attacked his hard heart no he had a better reason a better one for his sort of man 
this better reason was that now that the english had been finally expelled from the country they were beginning to call attention to the fact that this king had gotten his crown by the hands of a person proven by the priests to have been in league with satan and burned for it by them as a sorceress therefore of what value or authority was such a kingship as that of no value at all no nation could afford to allow such a king to remain on the throne it was high time to stir now and the king did it that is how charles seven came to be smitten with anxiety to have justice done to the memory of his benefactress he appealed to the pope and the pope appointed a great commission of churchmen to examine into the facts of joan's life and award judgment the commission sat at paris at domremy at rouen at orleans and at several other places and continued its work during several months it examined the records of joan's trials it examined the bastard of orleans and the duc d'alencon and dolan and pascarel and courcel and isambard de la pierre and monchon and me and many others whose names i have made familiar to you also they examined more than a hundred witnesses whose names are less familiar to you the friends of joan in domremy vaucouleur orleans and other places and a number of judges and other people who had assisted at the rouen trials the abjuration and the martyrdom and out of this exhaustive examination joan's character and history came spotless and perfect and this verdict was placed upon record to remain forever i was present upon most of these occasions and saw again many faces which i have not seen for a quarter of a century many of them well beloved faces those of our generals and that of catherine boucher married alas and also among them certain other faces that filled me with bitterness those of beaupere and courcel and a number of their fellow fiends i saw omette and little manguette edging along toward fifty now and mothers of many children i saw noel's father and the parents of the paladin and the sunflower it was beautiful to hear the duc d'alencon praise joan's splendid capacities as a general and to hear the bastard endorse these praises with his eloquent tongue and then go on and tell how sweet and good joan was and how full of pluck and fire and impetuosity and mischief and mirthfulness and tenderness and compassion and everything that was pure and fine and noble and lovely he made her live again before me and wrung my heart i have finished my story of joan of arc that wonderful child that sublime personality that spirit which in one regard has had no peer and will have none this its purity from all alloy of self-seeking self-interest personal ambition in it no trace of these motives can be found search as you may and this cannot be said of any other person whose name appears in profane history with joan of arc love of country was more than a sentiment it was a passion she was the genius of patriotism she was patriotism embodied concreted made flesh and palpable to the touch and visible to the eye love mercy charity fortitude war peace poetry music these may be symbolized as any shall prefer by figures of either sex and of any age but a slender girl in her first young bloom with the martyr's crown upon her head and in her hand the sword that severed her country's bonds shall not this and no other stand for patriotism through all the ages until time shall end end of personal recollections of joan of arc by mark twain your reader john greenman so i just have this picture in my mind of twain weeping as he wrote the last two paragraphs of this book. And very unfortunately, Joan of Arc gets used now. <laughs> she was used in her life. She is also used in death as a patriotic stand-in. So Marie Le Pen, wow, used Joan of Arc as a symbol for her kind of scary political campaign when she was running 
for office in France. She's been used to sell products. She's She's been used everywhere. And I think it's probably a really good thing that Twain didn't live long enough to, to see that. Once she was canonized in, the, in, in 1920, in the 1920, I think it was 1920, that made her famous. So you have Twain's book, you have her canonization, and then you have this kind of resurgence of, wow, Joan was a kind of interesting person. And nobody really remembers the first time that they learned about her. If you hear about her when you're a kid, you kind of just always knew about her. And lots of people have this non-memory memory, like, oh yeah, no, I, I guess I heard about her when I was a kid. She's a very, very interesting historical character. And again, oddly, one of the most documented historical characters we've got from this time period. And because of that, I think Twain had to make some choices about which parts of her trials and her life she, he was going to report to us. Like, there's the, the part where she's questioned on why St. Margaret, who's British, is speaking French. And at one point, she says, yes, they, my saints speak French, or my voices speak French better than you. But there was another zinger that she had, because they kept asking her the same questions, trying to trip her up. It was asked a slightly different way. Why would St. Margaret, an English saint, speak French? And her response was, well, she speaks French because she's not on the side of the English. Duh. So it had to be hard to figure out what to keep in and what to leave out. And of course, there were ridiculous questions asked of her in the trial as well. Like, why did you try to escape? Well, gee, guys, <laughs> I, think, I think what you see happening in front of you gives you a pretty good idea of why I tried to get out of Dodge. Now, the part that Twain doesn't talk about I don't know that this was Twain being a puppet master at all. I'm not entirely sure how much of this information he would have had access to. I'm not sure how much had been translated or written about at the time, uh, but my guess is quite, quite little. Uh, Charles VII. Certainly, as I grew up knowing about Joan of Arc, my overdeveloped sense of injustice made me uh, horrified that the king did not step forward and get her out of there. And that's because nobody told me that he did try. He at least himself tried to uh, pay a ransom for her early on. And uh, that didn't work. That was not accepted by the English slash Burgundians at the time. Then there were at least two, maybe more than that, uh, rescue attempts that were made. The first one was kind of on his own. Lahir, not surprisingly, tried to go get her. And that didn't work. And then Charles funded at least one other rescue attempt involving Lair as well. Obviously, getting close to her was going to be difficult at best because the British really needed to prove that she was bad, evil, wrong, a witch, a heretic, so that they could delegitimize Charles as part of that process. And they needed to get her condemned in a way that she couldn't be used as a martyr, because that would be bad. And oops. And it's funny, Joan's response to the, why did you try to escape, always makes me think of Bertolt Brecht when he was brought in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee in the United States, uh, was spoken to strongly by McCarthy and his ilk saying to him, you know, we've, we've found these documents in which you are urging people to rise up against their government. And Brecht said, yes, I always thought that was a good thing to do when dealing with Nazis. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, dang, point taken. Okay, next question. Do, 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 do. You know, just kind of, all righty then. But trying to be fair to Charles brings up a couple of other things. One, Andrew and I were able to find George Bernard Shaw's St. Joan as a movie. It's very hard to find. IMDb links out to the wrong version. Uh, wow. It was just hard to find. But we did eventually, and I am putting a link to that in the show notes for you. Uh, it's, it's free. The movie's interesting. And the girl who's playing Joan, this is the first acting she ever did. She went on to have a challenging rest of her life. It was not, not easy, and she died young herself. There are moments where she is glorious, and there are a lot of moments where I thought, mm, well, yeah, okay. But the thing that really 
made both Andrew and, and me very sad was Richard Widmark. <laughs> it's got a cast. It's got a heck of a cast. Gielgud lights up the screen. He is ferociously evil and marvelous, kind of gloatingly evil. Couchon is played very cool and very smooth. But there are other characters that are kind of amalgams of other people. Either that or they're just pronouncing the names in ways that didn't make any sense to me. But regardless, Widmark, who historically played heavies, like heavy heavies, he's playing Charles VII. And sadly, he is playing him as gay as the day is long. And yet, because it's Shaw, what he is saying is actually pretty close to real. There is no proof that this man was gay or bi or anything. He was accused of being weak by a lot of people, but he just preferred to negotiate. And if you think back to, if you were listening to Aaron Ziegler's Chop Bard on Hamlet, one of the things that he pointed out, which just rocked my world, was if you look at the way Hamlet's father is described, he was the, the military might. He's, he shows up as a ghost in his armor. He was the fighter. And Claudius is, you know, let's sit down and talk. Let's send some diplomats over to Norway and just have a little chat. Maybe we can solve these problems in some way that doesn't require us killing each other. We've had a lot of killing. Let's try something new. And that's kind of Charles VII. He was encouraged by Tremouille to set up treaties that went badly during Joan's tenure. That probably had to do more with Tremouille than Charles. Tremouille did not live long, happy days after all of this. Actually, none of the people who went up against Joan trying to, to knock her down None of them did particularly well for themselves post, post-trial. But in trying to negotiate, Charles VII did some interesting things. For one thing, it was incredibly expensive what the English were funding. They paid, was it 10,000 pounds? 10,000? I can't even remember. It was a dumpster load of money for Joan. So they paid all that money. At the Battle of Pate, they basically, it was a reverse Agincourt. So instead of at at Agincourt, the British longbowmen shot over the heads of their own army, and these arrows rained down like fire from the heavens upon the French with such force that the arrows were able to pierce armor. So those arrows took out all of the French. That's how Agincourt went down. Well, the reverse happens at the Battle of Pate, which is one of Joan's battles. I believe the British got flanked. Uh, their lines were broken, and the French moved in and wiped out all the longbowmen. So the guys who could shoot the British longbow at pretty much an entire generation it was going to take to regrow those ranks. So the, the cost, Joan of Arc's cost to the British was not small. And with the loss of Henry V and Henry VI being a baby and all the other things going wrong, Charles wound up in a much better position to negotiate with the English and come out on top, which is why he really, really needed to not have his authority undermined by potentially having people be able to say, well, yes, but he was brought to the throne by this heretic, this witch, this bad person, this Joan. So he did try to ransom her. He did try to rescue her. Yes, he was more peace-loving or at least peace-pursuing than Joan seems to have been. But Joan, one of the history groups that I watched, said that her main tactic, although the Bastard of Orléans does say, and I think Lair says too in her trial of nullification, that her use of positioning armories, whether it was cannons or people or whatever, was really quite advanced for somebody who was not trained. This one historian said that her, her main tactic was, let's get them. And that's kind of true that she was out in front, she was leading the charge, she was inspirational. And that led me to looking up, okay, well, when people poo-poo Joan of Arc and say, yeah, but really, I mean, she was a chick and she was small, how much could she really have done? I started looking for answers to that question. 
you know, was she just a morale booster or did she really fight? And I found a very interesting post by a European martial arts instructor and author who did some research and he found a book by Joffrey de Charny. It's either a book written by Joffrey de Charny Sr. or Joffrey de Charny Jr. Either way, this is a real book. You can look it up. It is one of the few medieval texts we have on what it means to be a knight. And in this knight's textbook, this how-to guide, they rank levels of knighthood, goodness of knighthood, from good to better to best. So good is you are in tournaments and you win tournaments. Why? Because that was actual danger. People did die in tournaments and jousts. So that's that's good. If you can show your prowess in that kind of a static situation where there is some danger, there is some risk, that's good. Better is to actually participate in a war, even if you don't personally clash weapons. Just because you're in the back and you never get into any hand-to-hand combat doesn't mean you weren't there, doesn't mean you weren't willing, doesn't mean you weren't prepared, and it doesn't mean you weren't in danger, witness Agincourt. The best, according to Joffrey, is to be a commander, an able commander. Now, that went through me because I thought, okay, really? And it's because, number one, you've had to work your way up, usually, to get to that level. You've had to learn how to think and plan and strategize and understand your people. But also that being a good commander means you were able to marshal your troops and and get people behind you and be a good role model, a, a good morale booster. In every respect, except for the good, the lowest level of chivalry, according to Joffrey, Joan is there. And in fact, Joan isn't in the back ever. Joan was in the front leading her guys into battle. Did she clash weapons with anybody? No, not that we know of. She certainly never killed anyone. She very likely smote people with the flat of her sword. We know that she did it at least once with a prostitute in the camp who she whacked on the tuchus with the flat of her sword and broke it. <laughs> so, so we know she did do that. I don't necessarily think of that as particularly violent. No, no harm, no blood, no foul. But did she have skill at arms? No. She was never trained. She didn't want to be trained. She had no reason to be trained. She was surrounded by people who were there to keep her safe. But she was absolutely in the middle of things. So if you asked her troops, did Joan fight? I think there's no question their response would be, uh, yeah. Did, did you see her up front with her banner? Yeah. So do you have to kill people to be a fighter? No. And I think that's part of what makes her trial of condemnation so galling. She, she told them in advance that if you try and torture me, I'll say whatever it is you want me to say. But the next day I'm going to take it all back. They show her the pile of wood and say they're going to burn her. And she kind of loses her place in time, signs her name to a document, what she thinks is one document, and then Couchant. And he did. He really did switch out her, her six-statement abjuration and replace it with a laundry list of all of the things that she did wrong. And then there are, in the trial of nullification, there are so many variations on what happened after that. It is important for the church especially in 1920, for her to still have been a virgin. So whether texts that talked about assaults on her at this particular point in time have been suppressed or burnt or lost, we will never know. There were certainly people at the trial of nullification who implied carefully that really bad things happened and Joan's women's clothes were taken from her and she was left only with men's clothes that she did push back and say, I can't wear these, but she was going to be taken out to the trial site. She had to have some clothes on, so she had to put her men's clothes on. She did go up against Couchon and tell him that this was on his shoulders and his alone. By this point in real time, at the time of her burning, people were 
were already turning on Couchon. It was clear at this point that he was just uh, McCarthy-like, kind of slathering and just like, let's get it over with now. It's been a year. Burn her. It's not a pretty look on anybody. But if you ever have somebody push back and say, well, you know, they say that her original trial, the trial of condemnation, was a kangaroo court, but really, and they try and somehow validate that court's findings, all you need to know is this. Just because it's the Middle Ages, just because it's 1430, does not mean that you don't have several hundred years of legal protocols that are required if a trial is being held. Now, there are lawyers and then there are ecclesiastical lawyers. Couchon brought in both at different times. The legit ecclesiastical lawyers were largely horrified, specifically because she was never provided an advocate. Now, under my understanding is under canonical law at the time, that invalidated the trial, period. You cannot have somebody unlearned, untrained, go up against a panel of legally trained people in a court and have it be legit. And the British were left with trying to prove one of three things. Either she lied, but she has for a year now been under oath of some sort, been under oath and has been very clear that the voices she heard telling her to do these things were real. So either she lied, well, she didn't because we have to believe her she's under oath, or she told the truth, but that's unacceptable because then how are they going to get rid of her? Or the voices were from the devil. So get her to abjure them, force her to renounce everything she's done, put her back in women's clothes, then very cleverly force her back into men's clothes so that even if she comes back and says, I didn't mean anything that I said, they still can come back and say, yes, but even though you're renouncing all of that, you still are back in men's clothes. That's unacceptable. You're a heretic. Now, there are some trial of nullification people who say that Joan was allowed communion after that last night when she was back in a dress. Not everybody says that, though. So it's, I'm not sure where that comes down. Joan's horror at not being taken back to an ecclesiastical prison after she had signed the papers and said she abjured, she's not wrong. She should never, ever have been kept in a regular prison. She never. This was an ecclesiastical trial, or it was masquerading as an ecclesiastical trial. She should never have been in a regular prison situation. Now, the the last thing that I wanted to fill you in on is it's fairly easy to look at how long it took for the trial of nullification to happen and just be disgusted. But in fact, there were some real reasons why that was not possible. For one thing, up until 1449, so the process of the beginning of the trial of nullification begins in 1450. So prior to 49, there were several things that were in the way. First, the English were still in Paris, and the University of Paris had provided people for the trial of condemnation in Rouen, which means the university had been active, playing a, a, an active role in Couchon's proceedings. So the university in Paris could only have been called out for its behavior after Paris was recaptured by the French. And that wasn't until 1436. All right. Secondly, the site of the trial, Rouen, was still held by the English. The documents from the original trial were in Rouen, and that town didn't come into Charles VII's purview until November 49. As long as the English held Rouen, nobody else could get to the paperwork to use it to prove that the original trial had been a load of garbage. So there, there wasn't anything they could do. It wasn't like they could show up and say, knock, knock, hello, Rouen, can you please get us copies of the trial of Joan of Arc transcripts? Not going to happen. So 
it's easy to look at it, especially as a child. It's easy to look at it and say, wow, the king was awful. Here she got him into his crown and then he turns his back on her. Mm, yeah, kind of no. It was more complicated than that. Just like, you know, normally in real life, yeah, things are a little bit more complicated than that. So, Joan, it is such a sad story. And she's such an interesting and complicated person. And Twain's love of her is, uh, the, more, the more I read the book, the more I just can't help but think she is a stand-in for his daughter. And it's that much sadder. That said, our next book is probably going to be a little bit more lighthearted. I have a couple in mind. I am going to be thinking long and hard about which one to do next. I want it to be fun. I want it to be light. I want it to be not very long. So more on that when I return from Ireland. I have no idea what I'm going to be able to post while I am in Ireland. I will try and post some things. It may be on TikTok. It may be on YouTube. It may be on LibriVox. I have no idea. It's going to depend on what I'm able to pull off technologically while in Ireland. Every time I go over there, there are different rules and ways to do things. So I don't know. However, the last thing I wanted to say is I, <laughs> I realized I've been doing this for so long. I don't think I've ever during the entire course of this book mentioned how you can support the show. So if you're interested in supporting the show and what I do here, you are more than welcome to support the show in one of several ways. One, you can make a donation and links to all of this are going to be in the show notes. Second, you can sign up for the old premium feed. I'm not putting out any new premium books, which were just the books, none of the crafty talk. They are still there. They are still available to you. That means Bleak House, Wuthering Heights, The Great Gatsby, which is just the talk, not the book, because back when I did it, the book was still under copyright. Picture of Dorian Gray, all of those are available as premium books. How do you get the premium books? You go to craftlit.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. And at the top, it'll say, hey, do you want to get access to premium audio? You click on that and it walks you through the process. That will suck $5 a month out of your account and that will give you access for as long as you are a premium member to all of the old premium books. And on the app, the easiest way to get it is through the Craftlet app, which you can get for Android or iOS. And once you're on the app, you can search for premium audio or regular audio and get it that way. The third way to support the show is Patreon. You can find Craftlet on Patreon. And again, five bucks a month over on Patreon gets you access to the premium books over there. Again, I have not had time to do premium books again since 2018. That was the last time I was able to do that. But all of the books that I did for the, I don't know, six years that I was doing premium books, five years, something like that, they're all there for you. So donate premium app subscriber or Patreon supporter. Links to all of that will be in the show notes. I am going to go pack my bags. You are going to go be well, be safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>